startup today. So it's it's our great honor to have uh, Dr. Mark Kahn here, who uh, comes to us from University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I have to thank uh, MDPhD student Daniel Jobin for really spearheading his invitation, which has been a, a real treat for us uh, yesterday as well as uh, today. So Mark uh, originally uh, told me he hails from uh, Queens, uh, New York. Um, and then uh, he attended uh, Brown University uh, combined program for both his uh, bachelor's of arts as well as his MD. He was uh, in the AOA society there. Um, he then uh, went out west and did his uh, medicine residency out at Ohio uh, Oregon uh, Health. And uh, I'm an echo. Um, and then went back um, to the um, East Coast for uh, the medical staff fellowship at the NHBI, NHLBI, uh, which he did for a few years and was, I think, had his kind of first major exposure to science and did some work with David Dicek out there. And then back um, to the West Coast, um, to UCSF, uh, where he was a clinical uh, fellow and then a postdoctoral fellow. I just learned, Mark, last night that I started my, my uh, uh, medical school at the same year that you started your clinical fellowship, both at, at UCSF. But unfortunately, I don't think I met Mark uh, back then. He um, worked with Sean Coughlin, did uh, great work on the uh, thrombin uh, receptor, which is a a really cool uh, protein that gets cleaved and Mark did a lot of the seminal work and then signals by itself to the uh, a receptor. He was an HHMI postdoctoral uh, fellow there. Um, and then uh, he was uh, recruited to uh, University of Pennsylvania and, and has rose through the ranks and um, is now the Edward uh, Cooper, Norman Roosevelt and Elizabeth Merwire McClure professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And um, it's really a, a um, shining example of a, of a physician scientist. I mean, he's a, a scientist that his work is really informed by um, his knowledge of uh, medicine and its top-notch uh, uh, scientific work. And I would say uh, he's, he's really admired, at least uh, by many, including myself, uh, this is being fearless in terms of the science, following it where it goes. He's done seminal work in platelet biology, in uh, cerebral cavernous malformations, as well as lymphatic and vascular uh, endothelial cells. So I'm, I'm excited to welcome Mark. Thanks for coming, Mark. Uh, uh, thanks, Dan. Yeah, I'm a pretty unusual choice I, uh, for uh, cardiology grand rounds. I almost never get invited, and I was scratching my head as to you know, why this happened. And then at dinner last night, that mystery was solved. I found that. So I'll thank Daniel Jobin, the MD PhD student who uh, really invited me here. Um, and okay, so uh, for the clinicians today, I'm really not going to be talking about human data directly. I thought um, what would be interesting would be to sort of look at the interface between basic laboratories like mine and clinical work. Um, in the form of mouse models, which is something that my lab has used for, you know, uh, since its inception, and I also did as a postdoc. And I'll, I'll focus on two stories, one related to cavernous malformation, which I think is uh, highly informative in terms of like um, how you can evolve a mouse model and to sort of slowly deconvolute uh, a complex pathogenic mechanism, and then a more recent story on the COVID-19 stuff. Okay, so mouse models are really a, a blessing and a curse. They're, they have, mice have an anatomy and physiology that is often, but not always, very well conserved with that in humans. I think the cardiovascular system is a particularly pretty good, especially during development. Some of the uh, disease pathology models are, are lacking, but, um, but it's a pretty good model there. Obviously, the major advantage, we can do functional studies, and I'll show you evidence of that and how we use genetics to do that. We have 25 plus years of, gen of you know, carefully collated and highly characterized tools in the mouse genetic toolbox. And then, you know, what for us was really an incredible leap forward was CRISPR-Cas, which allows us to, you know, make very sophisticated models in mice, um, really stuff that using standard you know, yes, cell recombination, we couldn't. Negatives, you know, obviously everything is happening pretty quickly unless you work in the grief lab 
and, uh, and wait 18 months to do an experiment. Um, but I'm, I'm actually okay with that. Uh, genetic backgrounds are much less diverse than humans. Some of the biologies are not well reflected. And, and, a, and a very important point that I think is not as well appreciated as it should be, especially if there are people who are not sort of embedded in this work, is that the results are highly dependent upon the approaches technically that are adopted. And this is really important. And you know, many of you may be aware of studies, for example, done by pharmaceutical companies that fail to reproduce more than 50% of reported results in mouse models. And a lot of that is you know, failure to sort of uh, take into consideration technical considerations when you, you know, interpret the results. OK, so uh, two diseases, two, two, uh, two models today. I already mentioned this. OK, we'll start with cavernous malformation. It's actually more common than we appreciate. This prevalence of 0 0.1 to 0.5% is real, but it's mostly on autopsy studies. Um, it's less clinically prevalent, but it is a pretty common cause of stroke and neurologic problems in younger people. About 200,000 individuals in the U.S. Have, are you know, walking around with strokes due to CCM. At Penn, we're seeing these patients weekly. Um, at the moment, there's no medical therapy. Um, what we try to do is resect the most aggressive lesions. And the MRI that I'm showing you at the bottom is a familial patient. They have a germline um, loss of function in, in one of the CCM alleles. And so they often present with tens, hundreds of lesions. Okay, so um, this is the natural history that I'll walk you through uh, in the next few minutes that I think is kind of interesting in a, in a broader way as well as for cavernous malformation. When we started the work, we had no idea what the molecular mechanism was how these proteins that are pretty, you know, anonymous. I mean, David knows from the work, you know, these are adapter proteins, you know, what's, you know, what is an adapter protein? And so going from that to a real molecular pathway that you can tie to pathogenesis is challenging. And I'll show you some genetic studies that help us do that. Then I'll tell you some studies that identified upstream inputs to this pathway that were unexpected related to the microbiome and the gut and a sort of gut brain axis. And then finally, genetic work first in the mouse and extending into the human that fully fleshed out the mechanism and actually led to what we think will be uh, some new therapies. Okay, so this is sort of the bottom line for how you get these lesions before I go through the, the studies. These CCM proteins are adapter proteins. They can bind a MAP kinase called MUKK3 that's quite important in endothelial cells. And they're a negative regulator. And when they're lost, MUKK3 becomes hyperactive. It drives expression of transcription factors, KLF2 and KLF4. And then voila, you get disease. Um, as I said, they're adapters. And when we started this work, you know, their molecular mechanism was really entirely unknown other than that they bound each other through pretty well-defined, and some of those you know, definitions were made by Dave Calderwood here, um, you know, molecular mechanisms. But what they did in the greater context of the cell and in the organism remained pretty obscure. So we, you know, we tend to use molecular genetics and developmental pathways. And the advantage of the developmental system is that although it's a very highly complex you know, building of the cardiovascular system, integrating thousands of uh, different signaling mechanisms, it's very stereotypic. So you can make a single small perturbation and then over and over again, you will see exactly the same phenotype or change. And you can just keep looking at that and keep looking at it like the movie Groundhog Day until you figure out exactly what's happening and why. And so we knocked out um, CCM1. Um, I won't show you the data. If you knock it out globally or even globally in all endothelial cells, you just get a very early lethal that's entirely uninformative. So that was kind of a dead end. But then we decided that, you know, it was well expressed in the heart. John Mabley, a uh, zebrafish biologist who uh, identified some of these genes by uh, forward genetic screens, had shown an important role in the heart. So we used a new CRE, a new CRE at that time, NFATC1 CRE from Binzao at Einstein to delete it only in the endothelial cells of the heart, the endocardial cells. And we saw a very interesting and for once informative phenotype. And that's that the cardiac jelly, which is this sort of, it's, uh, you know, in, in tissue sections, it's really just a space, but it's filled with proteoglycan containing versican hyaluronic acid. 
that jelly was virtually absent in the uh, CCM knockout, endocardio knockout animal. And that was an interesting phenotype. Um, you know, this was sort of, uh, the, we began to look at RNA-seq. It's at that time, it wasn't as sophisticated. Now, this is not even bulk RNA-seq. This is microarray, <laughs> which is really sounds old now, but it was very informative. Uh, what we found was an explanation for the loss of the uh, jelly, which is Adam TS5 expression, and some other uh, proteases that we know degrade cleave versicam. And then a whole bunch of proteins shown here in red that we know are targets of these two transcription factors, KLF2 and KLF4, that are also highly upregulated. So this was a big clue. We found a transcriptional you know, derangement that not only was it very clear because it was you know, black and white, but it was, you know, the, the transcription factors had already been worked on quite a bit by us, actually, you know, serendipitously, and, and many others. And, and we already knew that many of these, these other genes were targets. So then we went on and we incorporated data that came from other contexts. And this is also a valuable, you know, part of scientific investigation. Um, Gary Johnson's group, which is an expert group in MAP kinases, they've really done pioneering work. Back in 2003, before the genes for this disease were even positionally cloned in humans, had done a yeast-2 hybrid screen with the MAP kinase MEKK3 and pulled out a protein that he called osm because he thought it changed osm regulated osmolarity. Um, we now know that that gene encodes a CCM2. So already there was a connection to MEKK3. And then others, uh, this is like Guillermo Garcia's lab that I'm, I'm citing here, a very nice JCI paper, had shown that the downstream effectors of MEKK3, MEK5 and ERT5, were direct regulators of KLF2. And so, you know, putting this together, it was pretty clear now that a lot of roads might lead from CCM to MEKK3 down to KLF2. And the only other trick that was really important that we found was that you know, a Gary's group thought that this was a positive regulatory mechanism. In fact, it was the opposite. It's a negative regulatory mechanism. So the first key to this puzzle was developmental work in the mouse, looking at the heart, early time points, E10.5, 11.5. And that showed that this complex bound uh, a MAP kinase that regulated critical transcription factors whose targets could do many things, including express metalloproteases such as Adam TS4 and 5, that degrade proteoglycan matrix. Okay, so of course, if you find something in an E10.5 mouse heart, it doesn't necessarily tell you what's going on in a patient. And so we next wanted to know if this, this was really a core pathway or just an interesting sort of digression into mouse developmental biology. And we looked at uh, human lesions. These are from Isama Wad's group in Chicago. He's a neurosurgeon who specializes in CCM. And indeed, we found that um, KLF4, for which we have very good antibodies, um, was highly upregulated in the endothelial cells that are shown in red here with PCAM staining of the lesions that were both fami from familial patients that I told you have a germline mutation, and also more importantly from sporadic patients for whom at this time, there was really no genetic information because it was quite hard to sequence. Um, sporadic lesions in which a tiny, tiny fraction of the cells were presumably mutant. And so, they, so this looked validated uh, in humans. And then we went on and used a mouse model that was a later time point. This was a model that I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment. Um, uh, this was identified by a group, Elizabeth turnier Lesser's group, who also did some of the positional cloning for CCM genes. And what she found was if you delete these genes in endothelial cells right after birth, lesions form. And indeed, that's the case. This is what happens if you delete CCM1. And this is a nice micro CT that we found is a very nice way of imaging these lesions. And we can actually quantitate volume very accurately. Um, and if you delete the CCM1 gene, but then take away only a single allele of the MEKK3 gene encoded by this MAP3K3, you can see it's almost a complete reversal of the phenotype Again, confirming the developmental findings in the heart that this is a negative regulator of MEKK3 and that MEKK3 is the key effector that gives you uh, the disease. Okay, so that was you know, very valuable, I think, uh, for the field because it gave us a focus. Um, we began to look at some other things. And what I'll tell you about now is some really some serendipitous findings that came along in the course of that work that establishes a, a, a gut-brain axis for this disease that was very unexpected. And the bottom line is schematically shown here 
and we can come back to this later, but what we found is that the critical input, at least in the neonatal model and to a lesser extent also in humans to MEKK3 is not um, a lot of the things that we thought it might be like blood flow and this and that, but instead it's uh, inflammatory signaling from gram negative bacteria that release lipopolysaccharide that then enters the blood and can activate the uh, toll-like receptor four, which is the innate immune receptor for LPS on endothelial cells. Okay, so that's an upstream mechanism. And the way we found this was very uh, serendipitous. Uh, at Penn, you know, we built a lot of new buildings. Um, so we had to move from this building to this building. Actually, it's a very nice space, so we weren't complaining about it, but we moved all our mice and we moved into a new mouse colony. And there were changes that I won't go into that turned out to be critical. The biggest one was the water they drink. In this building, the water was piped into each cage. So it's the same tap water that we would drink. Here they use bottled water, which is highly acidic to keep stuff from growing in it. And what, we ha what happened was these mice, after, they, uh, move, after we moved our colony, began to lose the phenotype. And this was an inbred colony that we'd used for the last few years. All of a sudden, there just wasn't any lesion forming. And I had not one, but two graduate students working on this, like Daniel and I, you know, they were looking at a pretty long road if we didn't figure this out. So, um, but there was a very certain interesting finding that they made and then brought to my attention that immediately kind of gave us a clue. They would have litters in which virtually all the genotype positive animals that should have developed lesions didn't. But the way we would induce a lesion formation would be to uh, inject the animals in the abdomen with tamoxifen to uh, activate the, uh, the Cre recombinase, which is the enzyme that will um, remove the active gene and, and turn it into a mutant allele. And every now and then, you know, if you poke enough of these animals in the tummy with a needle, you will get leakage of you know, gut contents and then an abdominal abscess will form. And that's shown here in this uh, you know, slightly older animal. And we found that in these abdominal abscess containing animals, which were fairly rare, but they were you know, frequent enough, they form lesions. And then all their litter mates that received the same treatment, same tamoxifen, but didn't have an abscess, didn't have lesions. And this was a gram negative. So uh, we took a close look at this. I'm skipping a lot of steps, but um, indeed um, we, we hypothesized that it was the gram negative bacteria from this abdominal abscess that was driving lesion formation. And we wondered if that was also the case when the, you know, in susceptible animals that did not have an abscess. And the way we tested that, and Alan Tang this is, did this experiment, was by both deleting the CCM gene and the toll-like receptor four from endothelial cells. And when we did that, we saw a remarkable dose-dependent reduction in the phenotype, a loss of a single TLR4 allele, greatly reduced lesion formation, loss of both in the endothelium only, virtually eliminated it. So obviously TLR4 signaling in this model was very important. And the next question is, you know, is this relevant? And this comes up over and over again. We'll come back to this even in the COVID-19 work. So um, is it relevant to human disease? We were very lucky. You know, this was the golden age of GWAS and uh, Helen Kim and Leslie Morrison at UCSF in uh, New Mexico had uh, been uh, studying a very interesting population in New Mexico. Uh, there was a founder, a couple of hundred years ago who moved to New Mexico from a Hispanic background with a point mutation that was in, uh, inactivating in the CRIT1 or CCM1 gene. And there are thousands of patients in New Mexico that have familial disease and carry this germline mutation. And so she, they had large families and they, they looked at these families and, you know, it was very heterogeneous. Uh, some patients would have no disease. They would and, but others were presenting, other, sometimes even in the same family, and they were having severe disease. So they, they looked for modifiers, disease modifiers. And indeed what they found, and they couldn't interpret the data, it was published at the time that we were making our findings, was that the two most important hits were on TLR4 and its co-receptor, CD14. And in fact, these hits were right in the uh, you know, five prime genomic region. And what we were able to find through available just public sequencing data is that these hits in a sort of dose dependent way significantly raise expression of both of these uh, genes. And so, you know, the hypothesis is, of course, that more TLR4, more CD14 gives you more signal input to the MEKK3 pathway and worsens disease.
And this indeed is the, sort of the, uh, the relationship that we saw between you know, the reference and uh, mutant alleles that raise these um, the gene expression. So definitely there's some relevance in humans to this you know, very serendipitous and somewhat bizarre mouse observation. And then uh, finally, you know, we thought this had to be gram negative bacteria uh, coming from the gut. And indeed, Alan was able to show this using both antibiotics and, you know, probably more heroically, but maybe mistakenly uh, using um, uh, germ free conditions that, you know, you need a gut microbiome in order to get lesions. And indeed, the reason uh, going all the way back to the first observation that we had lost the phenotype when we moved from one facility to another was that we had shifted from one microbiome in the animals to another. And the susceptible animals, fortunately, we maintained a colony in the original uh, building and we were able to compare susceptible and resistant animals in the two buildings. The susceptible animals had a much higher level of this uh, bacteroidetes, a very uh, uh, gram negative bacteria um, in, the, uh, in the gut. And this is actually a fairly invasive one. So it probably contributes a lot of LPS and um, is a driver of the disease in our mice. Um, and finally, uh, Isama Wad did some work on this, also looking at gram negative bacteria in the microbiome of patients that he saw and indeed found that higher gram negative bacteria would um, correlate with somewhat worse disease. Okay, so that sort of establishes gut brain axis. And before I move on from that, I'll just add one little clinical, you know, explanation that I thought was interesting. You know, when we found this, obviously it's vanishing the small amounts of LPS that escape from the gut into the blood. I mean, it's almost, it, it is unmeasurable. And in fact, um, if one looks at the literature for LPS signaling in, uh, in healthy people or animals, almost the only assay that will pick it up are bioassays that, you know, put LPS on cells that are, you know, highly tuned to sense LPS because it's such a dangerous pathogenic uh, stimulus. So um, we wondered though, you know, how is this, you know, affecting the disease? How is it getting into the blood in people? Um, and so we, we looked at the gut barrier and if you disrupt the gut barrier pharmacologically, this is just dextran sodium sulfate, you can massively increase the disease in mice. And this is also true if you do it genetically. And this genetic, um, mutation is in mucin-2, which is the major er, uh, mucus-producing um, protein that sort of coats the bottom, you know, the epithelium of the gut and separates it from the billions of bacteria that we have in the microbiome. This is, was a particularly important experiment for the next chapter that I'll tell you about that connects back to the human disease. So the clinicians have, you know, been following these patients for quite a long time now. This work actually is from uh, Isam Awad and Doug Martrick, collaborators of ours. And we know that if you follow familial patients, those with a germline mutation in one of these three genes, that they don't all have the same uh, natural history. The CCM1 and CCM2 patients look about the same. They typically present in midlife with lesions, um, sometimes many, but they, you know, they, they don't have symptoms till about midlife typically. But the CCM3, and its gene name is PDCD10, patients look completely different. They all present as children, often in the first few years after birth, with a severe lesions that cause stroke. So it was, this has been a clinical oddity that's not clear. And it also wasn't clear from what we understood of the molecular mechanism, which is that you know, it's a complex and, in fact, the direct regulator or, you know, interactor with, CC, with MAKK3 with CCM2, not CCM3. So why should this be the case? Why should it be different from the other two? Um, and the answer lies in that mucin protein I told you about a moment ago. I won't show you the data, but CCM3, unlike one and two, participates in a totally separate molecular complex, the stripe pack complex, that is important for moving vacuoles and cargo out of secretory cells. There's a secretory cell in the gut called the goblet cell that some of you may know. Um, it produces that mucin, that mucus. And in fact, um, in mice that are CCM3 deficient, there is a severe reduction in this uh, mucus layer. And in, um, when we delete CCM3 in gut epithelial cells only, um, we can, uh, on top of brain endothelial loss of uh, CCM3, 
we can magnify the uh, lesion formation. The top here is brain endothelial loss of CCM3. And then we'll throw in a second Cree that will delete the gene now in the gut epithelium. It truly, it magnifies uh, the disease significantly. So the hypothesis we have to explain that, you know, very solid clinical observation is that CCM3 heterozygous individuals are running around with just a, a significantly less mucus barrier than um, our CCM1 or 2 head individuals. And therefore, they have just that much more opportunity to have LPS leak out of the gut, stimulate, and over a lifetime, uh, unfortunately, this results in presentation even decades earlier. So again, a very nice correlation. Things don't look exactly the same in the mouse as they do in the human, but these basic pathogenic mechanisms can be teased apart in using both. Okay, then our final chapter on this CCM stuff, because I know most of you never see these patients. In fact, I don't either. Um, but um, this, this, this was also quite interesting and, and comes directly out of just deep interrogation of the mouse model. And what we found in this final chapter is that the pathogenesis is more complex than we thought. It isn't just loss of CCM genes, there's a second hit. And the second hit is exactly like the second hit in cancer, where you can think of CCM genes as like the tumor suppressor half of the cancer and um, the, uh, the, you know, the second hit, which is PIK3CA as the, the, you know, the growth enhancing hit. Okay, so I told you about this neonatal model that was developed first at the Turnier Serve lab and then used by most of the investigators in this field. And it's pretty straightforward. If you delete any of these three genes in the day or two after birth, you develop lesions. But there's some funny aspects to it. The first is that you don't develop lesions everywhere. You, you develop in the brain, which is nice because that's where they form in people. But you only develop it in certain parts of the brain, specifically the hindbrain, shown here. Forebrain has almost no lesions. And you develop it in the retina. And, and so you, why is that? And we knew this for a long time, that the retina and hindbrain are parts of the CNS that are highly angiogenic after birth. Much of the rest of the brain has been more angiogenic prior to birth, but these areas are very angiogenic in, in the immediate postnatal period. So there was some correlation there, but still it was a little mysterious. But the weird part um, was that deletion in adults, and we're talking even just a week or two after birth, gives absolutely nothing in the way of lesions. And this just wasn't just our lab. Turnier Lesserve lab, when they first reported this model, were mystified by this. They said, well, we don't know, so we'll work on the neonates. Well, you know, what the hell, we have a good model. But this was something that really bugged us and we kept looking at it. And we, you know, we could not think of a mechanistic reason why this would be so important, but we were aware of the proliferation. Alan Tang then did the sort of experiment where we knocked out the, the, uh, the pathway in adult mice. These are two months of age when we knocked it out. And then we did a really thorough autopsy. So very appropriate for this, uh, I guess, this, uh, you know, this forum. And this hadn't been done previously. And, and the animal was totally fine everywhere except for the testis. And you can see these are the testis of the knockout animals. And they were bloody and basically appeared much like the brains uh, of animals that were deleted in neonatal life. And when we looked histologically, they basically had cavernomes. Um, and they had all the molecular hallmarks I won't show you of high KLF2 and 4 and all the other stuff. They were just in the testicular vasculature rather than the brain. And when we looked in the brain, in fact, we had high KLF4, which is, um, I think this is KLF4, oh, yeah, it is, um, which is again, the better antibody, especially in the mouse. So we were able to confer the molecular changes that we had previously associated as causal for the disease, but we weren't getting the disease in the brain, we were getting it in the testis. So why is that? Again, you know, there's some prior work that put this in a little context. This is an old paper um, looking at rat endothelial cells, simple approach, BRDU injection, which ones are proliferating and where. And they found that um, for reasons I'm not actually that aware of, that the testis has the highest rate of endothelial proliferation in an adult rat. And, and that rate is, you know, much higher, probably an order of magnitude at least higher than the rate in the brain, which has one of the lowest rates of endothelial proliferation. So this kind of, again, uh, solidified our suspicion that there was a proliferative input that was necessary beyond the loss of the complex and its effect on MEKK3. So what was that input? Um, and then I already mentioned this, so sorry, it was a little bit out of order. Again, in the neonate, 
you get these lesions in the retina and the hindbrain, highly proliferative sites. Well, you know, these lesions look, the one thing we had known is that the lesions form in particular places in the venous, in the, in the vascular uh, tree of the, of the brain. And that's really in the post-capillary venule. And this is true also in humans, and we can see it in the white matter by MRI. And at this, you know, by this point in the history of this disease, a lot of work had been done in other what are called low flow venous and lymphatic malformations. And what had been found by Mika Vicula and many other groups is that these patients harbor often mutations in the uh, PIK3CA, which is the enzymatic component of the PI3 kinase growth pathway. Sometimes they harbor mutations, say, in the TI2 receptor that activate uh, PI3 kinase, but a lot of it came down to PI3 kinase, and it was very similar, and, and it was driving um, proliferation. So we didn't immediately think that it was going to be so directly equal, but we thought in the lab, well, let's see if PI3 kinase activation can provide that proliferative signal in the brain, and then maybe we'll see lesions in the adults that we don't see. And so that. That's exactly what we did. We did the same experiment I showed you before, deleting the CCM pathway using the, uh, this is a brain endothelial specific crease. So it's very, very refined in terms of the genetic strategy. And, but this time we layered on one other thing. This is an old allele, uh, you know, for that, that expresses PI3 kinase with an H1047R, very common mutation in cancer that causes it to be um, a gain of function allele. And it's expressed from the Rosa 26 locus, but only when there's CRE. So now we're conferring both CCM loss of function and PIK3CA or PI3 kinase gain of function at the same time and in the same cells. And when we did this um, in the neonate, we saw that the PI3 kinase was sufficient to give lesions. And actually, I won't show you the data, but they looked a lot like the uh, CCM lesions, but that the, the two together um, uh, had tremendous synergy. The reason you don't see any lesions in this uh, neonatal CCM only knockout is that we're doing this experiment on the resisting colony in that in the facility that you know is uh, less likely to give you lesions. We did that just to give it a cleaner background to look for synergy. But it, clearly there was a you know a very important interaction here, at least potential interaction. So then we had to design the experiment in the adult, and again technical considerations matter. In this particular case, we found that our you know favorite CRE this uh, SLCO1C1 uh, brain endothelial specific CRE and every other CRE that we looked at leaked. And so what we would get is a small number of cells that would have all these genes activated early in life. And then before we gave the animals tamoxifen, which I told you is the way to you know, get this gene deletion and activation done, they would actually die from very large lesions, often in the spinal cord. And this is the survival curve. So that wasn't going to work. Uh, fortunately, we had a very good neurosurgical fellow come to the lab for a year. And I said, well, why don't you try doing this with a cranial window? See if you can get anywhere. You guys know how to op operate on the brain. And indeed, uh, she, she, she figured out a very nice protocol. Uh, these are adult animals that carry all the phlox alleles, but they don't have a Cre allele. And instead, what she would just make a cranial window. Um, we would use an AAV Cre. And we would just put a needle in, inject the Cree. We would get this local area of the brain where we would get Cree activity to knock out the CCM gene and activate the PI3 kinase gene. And lo and behold, these animals develop lesions. And for those of you who know about CCMs, they look exactly like this, that kind of, it's called a mulberry appearance. And you can appreciate that here, like these, these kind of lumpy, bumpy, like uh, parts of like, almost like a mulberry. And indeed, um, in the adult, it was much more striking than in the neonate because in the adult, we get no lesions with loss of the CCM complex, no lesions with gain of the PI3 kinase uh, pathway, and then together, massive lesion formation. So a really one zero synergy in the adult that pointed to sort of a biogenic mechanism. Again, relevance, you know, are we just creating some artificial way to drive proliferation it has nothing to do with disease? So we went to our collaborators, Doug Marchick and Dan Snellings, a very, really bright um, PhD fellow, a PhD candidate at the time. And they went back to their like, you know, panel of CCM um, samples that they had, that they had, you know, sequenced for CCM gene mutations and looked at PIK3CA. And lo and behold, the vast majority have PIK3CA lesions, uh, PIK3CA mutations. And in fact, the mutations 
are exactly the same mutations that have been identified in thousands and thousands of patients. You can see the difference in the, uh, the y-axis here in, in cancer patients. This is a much smaller y-axis because we have much smaller uh, sample size for CCM patients, but basically it's the same exact uh, molecular mechanism. So this biogenic synergy is present um, in human lesions. And, and part of this, and we can discuss it later, people have questions, is we are looking specifically at the lesions that were resected from people's heads. These were the ones that were growing the fastest, hemorrhaging the most, causing the biggest neurologic deficit. And then this is just a nice, uh, elegant experiment that Dan pulled off at Duke using some uh, a new technology. You know, a question mechanistically is whether these mutations are arising in the same exact cell, and therefore, you know, the synergy is a molecular synergy within the cell, or whether there's sort of some more complex intercellular interaction. Dan was able to show, and I won't go through the, the technique, that he could identify mutations that are mostly within the same exact genome and therefore the same cell. So it's pretty much exactly like cancer. Um, and then the, the, the final bit on this is, you know, what is the, the, the mechanism of this interaction? There are obviously two possibilities. One is that PI3 kinase activation adds to the MEKK3 mechanism that we already knew about, or alternatively, the MEKK3 mechanism that we knew about adds to the PI3 kinase mechanism. Well, you know, at some point they have to be interacting since they're in the same cell. Um, when we looked, uh, the first thing we looked for was PI3 kinase signaling. And in fact, this was very striking. And, and you know, we're looking here at um, FASO S6, a marker of mTOR, which is downstream of PI3 kinase. And we had never done this before, but when we looked at just the CCM knockout neonate that have lesions, they were just screaming with, uh, with FASO S6 and exactly had actually just as much as the neonatal lesions that I showed you earlier that were generated by PI3 kinase gain of function. So the, the, down, the mechanism, and I won't go into details, it's all published, is that the MEKK3 KLF pathway feeds into and then further sort of juices the PI3 kinase growth pathway. And this is the double mutant that just goes absolutely crazy. This is the pathway. And, and then the last part here, which is you know, pretty satisfying, is that you know, this is a pathway that's been worked on for decades. It's, you know, and, and for which uh, therapeutic approaches have been established for decades, for a long time, including rapamycin types of drugs, such as sirolimus that are FDA approved, even off patent. So, you know, the next thing was to take that adult model, ask whether we could treat it with rapamycin. This is the neonatal model. And you can see even in the neonatal model, there's a dramatic effect of rapamycin on lesion formation. And then really satisfying is the adult model, which is, we think, very close genetically to the sporadic lesions that require treatment, but sometimes can't be resected because of their location in the brain or spinal cord. And they had a very dramatic response to rapamycin. Okay, um, I think I'll skip this for the sake of time. If people have questions. So the lessons from these studies is that the pathogenesis is very much like cancer. There's a synergy between a, a suppressor and an activator that uh, the developmental studies um, at the time that you perform them can seem very remote from a disease mechanism. And I know we all think about how to make a disease model, but it's often not as remote as we might imagine. And uh, that mouse models have a lot of imperfections. Sometimes those imperfections can actually be clues that bring you back to things that were missed even in people. Had, you know, had the gene human geneticist simply sequenced PIK3CA, this thing would have been solved you know, years ago. And, and again, working over time and with technical consideration of the mouse models can really um, improve your understanding of the pathogenesis and even lead you to a nice preclinical model to test therapy. Okay, in the last few minutes, I'm gonna tell you about a second story. You know, and uh, beginning of 2020, Penn, you know, they told us that there's a pandemic on and all my mouse work has to stop. And my lab, you know, does mouse work. So, and then, but there was a little, little catch. And they said, but if you're working on SARS-CoV-2, you can still do mouse work. So we figured, you know, why, why if you can't beat them, join them. So um, we decided to uh, generate mouse models to look at SARS-CoV-2. And as you uh, most all must know by now, SARS-CoV-2 enters the cell by binding this ACE2 transmembrane uh, protease that uh, is on the surface of many cells. 
Um, it's a bad disease, COVID-19. Although the vast majority of people experience asymptomatic or non-hospitalized illness, but there is that small fraction, more evident in the first waves of the disease like Delta, that um, in which we saw a real severe hypoxemic respiratory failure that was rapidly progressive associated with thrombosis and, and vascular thing, uh, complications. So we were interested in this and you know we had all the kind of like the technical skills. So we thought we would begin to investigate this. Okay, so how would you study in the laboratory? Well, you, you know, you need a, a mouse model to a model that you can, that's stable and reproducible, and that most important provides phenotypes that look like those in patients. And the problem with the mice for COVID-19 was that the virus does not bind uh, mouse ACE2. So, you know, putting this virus into mice yields nothing. And um, so we needed a different model. Now, um, SARS-CoV-2 is related to SARS. And after the original SARS outbreak, the Perelman lab made a keratin-18 model. Keratin-18 is uh, expressed highly in epithelial cells. I'll show you it's not only in epithelial cells, it's also in brain. And they wanted to study pulmonary disease. So they made a keratin-18 model with ACE2. Um, but the problem with these models is that they're constitutive and uh, they, you can't dissect pathogenesis by looking at one cell or another cell specifically. So we designed, and when I say we, it's Alan Tang and I in the lab, we designed a number of different strategies. I'll tell you about the most interesting ones that would let us express human instead of mouse ACE2 from the mouse locus, but also in a manner using Crelox that we could turn off the expression um, in a very, either at a particular time point in the disease course, or more importantly, in particular cells. And this is just how we did this. I won't go into the technical details. And I think you all can appreciate that Creed basically makes this inactive. Okay, so we made these mice. And I'll tell you about the wrinkle right up front because it'll come back and we can talk about it later if it's time. When we looked at uh, with a pan ACE2 antibody that recognizes mouse and human ACE2, what we found is our mice had higher than endogenous levels of ACE2 in the brain and also to a lesser extent in the lung. Levels that really were much higher than the almost undetectable levels in the wild type animal. And this will come back to be an important point. When we looked at the actual localization of the protein, which is shown here in red, it has exactly the, you know, what was been described earlier. It's expressed on the very, it's a very unusual a protein. Uh, actually, a lot of its function remains remarkably obscure despite its importance in, in, in vascular disease and elsewhere, but it's expressed on these epithelial cells in the gut and in the kidney on the apical surface. That's also true in the nose, and I'll show you that, and that's important later. When we deleted the gene, uh, or at least the, the poly A and the cassette, we could eliminate completely expression of, uh, of the protein. This is just looking at kidney. Strong expression in the allele is completely wiped out with Cree. In the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the gut, the same, and this is just by IHC, you can see that as well. You know, the problem with these experiments is it's not that easy to study. You know, this is not as bad as Dan's experiments, but it's getting there. Uh, you know, we have to basically put these mice have to be studied in an ABSL3 facility, which is totally, you know, uh, isolated. Um, when we actually started these studies, Penn did not have a mouse ABSL3 facility, which was interesting because discovered that after a few months. And, uh, but we made a very, had a very nice collaboration with Hector's group, Hector Aguilar Carreño in, uh, at, at, at Cornell, where I had been actually just serendipitously visiting Cornell's vet school before the pandemic. And then uh, eventually Penn created a, uh, an ABSL3 and Peter Hewins shown here in, in, with Kelly and Gerardo helped us do a lot of experiments. Okay, so the first thing after, but what happens to these mice when you give them SARS-CoV-2? Well, actually, they all died. And so this was quite satisfying in some ways, or perhaps not for the mice. But um, what we found was that they had a really you know, steep uh, survival curve where the, you know, the mice that had the uh, Leo would basically uh, exhibit uh, weight loss within a few days and death within a week. If we deleted it with Cree globally, we could completely reverse um, this loss in weight and, and, survive, and, the, uh, and, and death. So the, um, the strategy seemed to work. And uh, this I'll show you is important. Um, the level of ACE2 that's expressed in different models determines whether you get a phenotype in mice. The only other model that gets a strong phenotype like this 
is the Perelman model I mentioned earlier that expresses in K18. It overexpresses as well. Um, that one's shown here. You can see it has a similar level of expression to ours in the lung. And although it's not as high as ours in the brain, it's much higher than these other models in terms of brain expression. And these mice also die um, over the course of about a week. When you compare this, this is a line that we generated that I haven't told you about that has, we call it hypo because it uh, sort of expresses at lower levels. And this is a line available at Jackson Labs made by the Wentworth Lab after SARS. And both of these lines express much lower levels of ACE2. And when you expose these animals to uh, SARS-CoV-2, they have uh, no detectable illness, no weight loss, they're fine. Much like many uh, healthy individuals. Okay, so this is what we know so far. The allele expresses well, it functions as a conditional allele. It does confer severe COVID-19 uh, symptoms and um, we, it does overexpress in the brain and lung. And we think that overexpression is sort of a, a, a trade-off. You need it to get um, disease. So the first question was whether you need lung infection for lethality, because obviously respiratory failure is the most prominent symptom. I won't go into the details, but there are two main epithelial cells in the lung, type one and type two. And um, there are very good Cree's that can hit both. We use the HOPX Cree for type one cells, surfactant protein C Cree for type two. And what we found is we could only detect by IHC ACE2 in the type two cell, which is uh, shown here with DC lamp co-staining. We couldn't see it at all on type 1 cells. But when we um, infected animals and stained for nuclear capsid, we could see virus in type 1 and type 2 cells. And then when we deleted with either the type 2 cell or the type 1 cell deleter, we could remove uh, the evidence of infection for either of those cell types. Um, and that's just shown here for type 2 and type 1. I'm moving quickly because we're a little short on time. And then another Cree that we use is a sonic hedgehog Cree, which deletes in almost all epithelial cells in the gut and in the, in the lung. And when we use the sonic hedgehog Cree shown here, we could also completely eliminate infection in the lung. And the infection is shown in green here as nuclear capsid. Okay, so this is just quantitation of, and this is also just actually, this was done by Hector's group, you know, actually growing out the virus. We can completely eliminate virus from the lung with sonic hedgehog Cree. So what happens uh, if you infect these animals? Well, remarkably, if you infect these animals, they still die. And in fact, there was a slight delay in, their, in, in, their, in the time of lethality, but it was by maybe one day. Um, instead of dying by six days, they would die by seven. Um, and there was a, you know, really very little difference. And interestingly, although they had no infection in the lung whatsoever, and we show this many different ways, they were severely hypoxemic prior to their death. And when we looked histologically at the lung, there was a tremendous amount of lung damage, even in the animals in which we had deleted ACE2 in the lung, in which we knew there was actually no virus in this lung. We could see you know, alveolar filling, we could see pulmonary vascular thrombosis and other signs of pulmonary vascular inflammation like von Willebrand's factor expression shown here. Okay, so the question became, well, they're clearly not dying from lung infection. What are they dying? Uh, the sonic hedgehog free distribution is kind of schematized here. It hits the epithelium basically from the mouth down into the, into the, the, the large airways like the trachea, the bronchi, and then the entire lung, as well as the gut. But what it doesn't hit, and we know is, is affected by uh, SARS-CoV-2, is the nasal epithelium, especially high up in the, in the, in, in the nose. This is just a reporter showing, you know, that sonic hedgehog Cree is very active in the trachea and lung, but we detected no Cree activity up in the respiratory epithelium or what's called the olfactory epithelium that, you know, helps you smell in the nose. And in fact, when we looked at the expression of ACE2 in the animals that were still dying, we could find that ACE2 is very highly expressed, and this has been shown in humans too, on the apical surface of the olfactory epithelium in the nose. So this became an obvious place to look. And when we characterized uh, the disease in that place, here we're following nucleocapsid with red staining for the actual virus, a lot of good antibodies for this. At two days post-infection, we saw a lot of infection in the nose and in the olfactory epithelium. But when we looked at that part that's next to the brain, 
which is the olfactory bulb of the brain from which the neurons come down that enable you to smell, there was no evidence of infection at two days. But when you look at five days, we saw a lot of evidence of olfactory bulb infection in the brain. And this is just another way of uh, you know, showing the same data, um, but this time with the sonic hedgehog Cree layered on. And you know, not surprisingly, since it's not active in the olfactory epithelium, the sonic hedgehog Cree had exactly the same disease course in the olfactory epithelium and the olfactory bulb. Okay, so the olfactory epithelium has composed of some epithelial cells like sustentacular cells, but you also have these neurons that come down from the brain and are the cells that actually you know, mediate smell. So obviously we wanted to now dissect this area genetically. Our first Cree was a Fox G1 Cree. It, it deletes in the olfactory epithelium as well as the olfactory bulb and other parts of the brain nearby. And that's kind of schematized in red here. If we delete sonic hedgehog, uh, delete ACE2 with the Fox G1 Cree, we can prevent infection up in the respiratory epithelium and the olfactory epithelium. That prevents infection in the brain and it also prevents disease in the lung. And these animals, in contrast to the sonic hedgehog animals that don't get lung infection, these animals now survive. They don't show uh, any hypoxemia. Um, when we do a similar experiment, BAF53B is more specific for neurons. So now we're not protecting the olfactory epithelium. That still has ACE2, but we are protecting neurons. Neurons no longer have ACE2. What we find is that there's a prevention of, of brain infection. Um, and BAF53B is also not expressed anywhere in the lung. So we still get infection of the olfactory epithelium because BAF53B is not active there. We prevent infection of the brain um, and we do not prevent infection of the lung and you can see nuclear capsid here. So now the lung is getting infected, the, the nose is getting infected, but the brain is not. And when you look at these animals, they also survive. They do uh, show some transient weight loss, but they have no hypoxemia and they have normal survival compared to the, uh, you know, the straight knock-in animals. So you know, what our study suggests is that it's the brain infection of the encephalitis that is driving an ARDS and hypoxemic response. And you know, we sort of looked at this another way with a gain of function allele that I don't have much time to go into, but it basically creactivates overexpression of ACE2. If you use a sonic hedgehog Cree, you're actually driving massive amounts of ACE2 in the lung. And that's shown with this anti-ACE2 antibody here on the right. So now this is way high. This is like, you know, higher even than the keratin 18. When we give these animals uh, SARS-CoV-2, they get a very significant infection in the lung. Needless to say, they don't get an infection in the brain because they don't have any in the nose or in the, in the, in the brain. Um, and they have maybe a small weight loss, but again, um, and they do have a transient hypoxemia, but they have a normal survival and they recover from this hypoxemia. So even rip-roaring infection in the lung of a healthy mouse is not lethal. Uh, conversely, if we use FOXG1, which will not put any ACE2 in the, in, the, in the lung, but it will put it in the olfactory epithelium and olfactory bulb, we can drive infection in, in, the, uh, in the brain without any infection in the lung. And these animals, uh, get severely hypoxemic and die. Okay, so um, more or less on time. Uh, this is, you know, our major conclusions from this model. Uh, some of these conclusions are not going to be controversial. I think that the dissection really shows that the ACE2 protein is absolutely essential uh, and stringently cell autonomous for infection. This is even in, this is something that's been debated in a lot of the papers you know, is, uh, for example, type one cells in the lung, no one can detect uh, ACE2, we can't either, um, but it's there because if you remove it uh, with a specific Cree, you prevent the uh, infection of those cells. Um, so it's probably a pretty good therapeutic. Uh, I think uh, the levels of ACE2 are clearly very important in the mouse model, probably also somewhat important in, in, in humans. Um, it's possible that it's a, you know, a uh, reason why some patients do worse than others. And then, you know, the really controversial part of this work was, you know, the conclusion that we couldn't escape that, you know, at least uh, neuronal infection in the mouse is what is associated with lethality and with ARDS. And, and you know, this, the jury is still out on, 
whether and to what extent this is an artifact of our model, because we do overexpress in the mouse, or whether our model is really representing patients who, who you know, that small fraction of patients who go on and have that, that you know, presentation. Okay, I'll finish here. Alan Tang is shown here on a hiking trip in a, at Gordon Conference. He's done all, a lot of the seminal work in, 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 in both of these stories that I told you about. Aileen Wren was uh, the, the first author on the paper that showed the two hit mechanism. And these are other folks in the lab who really made a lot of contribution and, and great collaborators, places like Duke um, and uh, Chicago and, and, and even Germany. Happy to take any questions. Go ahead. Um, Mark, another fantastic talk and, and great work. Um, so your search for a second hit, especially when you have heterogeneous phenotypic expression of any given gene mutation phenotype is, is a smart thing to do. And I was fascinated by the LPS, TLR4, CD14 story and, and the gut um, barrier uh, piece of this. So there are a lot of, I guess I would call them auto-inflammatory diseases, for example, celiac disease, where there are immunogenotypic responses against commensals. So this is not pathogenic bacteria, but commensals in the gut. And that leads to cytokine production, gut barrier breakdown and lots of organ, distant organ uh, type disease. So, um, you know, that's a long winded preamble as usual for me, but I, I, I just wondered about whether you've looked for any HLA haplotype um, predilection in that heterogeneous disease phenotypic. No, we really haven't, um, you know, partly because you know, there are gut brain axes that are pretty complex and, and more in, indirect, and that would involve immune cells and inflammatory cells, like, like the celiac mechanism you're describing. But we're seeing, you know, the, the genetics show a remarkably direct mechanism. When we, the TLR4 experiment I showed you was just endothelial loss of TLR4. And I would say that before that experiment, I, I couldn't tell you what endothelial TLR4 is really doing most of the time. But you had the epithelial CCM3. That's right. That's right. That was the, that, that one. And that, that it's very possible in that case that there's more going on that, than just the mucus you know, reduction. And that maybe there's gut inflammation that sets in and that also enables more LPS to cross over from the gut into the blood. But I think at the actual like endothelial cell level, it looks like TLR4 is the, you know, the direct target. But it, there's probably room for that. We can talk about that later, Jeff. Hi, Mark. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I'm very, uh, I have a naive and a basic question. I'm very interested in this uh, CCM, MAC, and uh, KF uh, axis. So uh, uh, what is the potential interaction for CCM to inhibit the MAC through inhibiting the kinase activity or inhibiting MAC and uh, MAC substrate uh, interaction? I think that's a Dave Calderwood question more than it is a, a, a me question. I, I mean, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't think it's really clear like how the complex is altering enzymatic activity. It's, it's not altering. I thought we are. Yeah, so... Is that eventually They're more likely to discover the answer to that at Yale than at Penn? <laughs> eventually, this axis affect uh, endothelia like uh, adherent junction or it le leading to this. Uh, that's a good leaking. question. I think we're going on that part, and that's something we're very interested in. Another way of asking your question is, you know, God didn't put the CCM complex in there to prevent you from having, you know, cavernous malformations. It has to have an endogenous role. That must be very important in endothelial homeostasis. What is that role? I don't really know. <laughs> it's a very interesting question. It turns out to be a little, the developmental studies, again, give us a clue to that. Um, clearly in the heart, you know, 
um, I think in the heart, the input to the pathway is not TLR4, not inflammatory. There is no inflammatory stimulus in any great abundance in the you know, sterile embryo. It's probably a fluid shear, especially in the endocardium. So there's probably some- Matrix. Yes, exactly. And you know, then, then you get into the mystery of cardiac jelly and why you have it, why you need to get rid of it, when you need to get rid of it. Um, but but it probably has to do with that. That's something Matrix like shear stress, versican, or those. Uh, in, in yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what cardi cardiac jelly is, versican and hyaluronic acid. And it, you know, Richard Harvey's done some great work on that, and this is very interesting. But so I think that in some way there are other totally different roles, probably related to flow, and you know maybe remodeling or stress. Yeah, yeah. stress yeah. matrix. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Very nice slide, Mark. Uh, so it, just an epidemiological question. Uh, in patients with OUC, I mean, Crohn's, they have a gut barrier uh, problem. Yeah, do yeah, you yeah. see? <laughs> I, I've been asked that a lot. So do, do patients with IBD get worse CCMs? Or... Yeah. Nobody can tell me about a clinical association. So I guess there isn't one. Um, but, you know, maybe the numbers aren't that, you know, it's like a lot of negative data until you, it, it's not definitive. But I don't know of any strong association between inflammatory bowel disease and CCM, which um, now I will give you maybe a little addition to that, to the usual, I don't know. Um, after we made the adult model and began to look at lesion formation that we believe arises in a manner much, much more closely faithful to human lesions involving both CCM loss of function and pic 3 ca gain of function, we've gone back to ask, you know, is that microbiome still so important now? Because there's a second input that's independent of the microbiome, that gain of function of PIK3CA, and also the animal's older now, and the gut is no longer immature, so it might be less leaky. And indeed, in the adult animal, there's very little impact in the, in the like with antibiotic treatment. To, uh, to prevent, to wipe out gut microbiome. So now we're scratching our head a little bit in terms of like, again, you know, go, you, you know, you, how, what is the, what, you know, so what is the input and, and, and what's, you know, why is it so much reduced? My feeling is it may well still be significant, but clearly it's not as significant as, as in that neonatal model. I think the human significance is probably still borne out by those you know, kind of blinded GWAS studies that identified TLR4 and CD14. But I would say it's not nearly as important as that, you know, the neonatal model might have suggested. Okay, I think we should wrap up here. Thanks, Mark. Wonderful. Uh, appreciate your uh, coming. Wonderful. Thanks.